Hi folks, this is Glenn Maurer and uh, we're here today uh, with a last, uh, or not last, but another episode of The Next Step TV Santa Barbara, uh, a show that is recorded here in the cable uh, and, and distributed on the cable uh, television system, Station 17 in the, southern, in the Santa Barbara area. Also available to those of you who are interested in looking at it on YouTube and Ustream, which you can find by Googling The Next Step TV SB or uh, on either, uh, and you get Ustream or, or um, I said Google, but I didn't, U Ustream more than um, YouTube. Some of the shows we've done in the past have been dealing with uh, uh, subjects that we're going to address slightly tonight, uh, and you might want to look at some of them about corporate abuse and corporate power and, uh, and the individual's attempt to deal with corporations. Um, the title of the show that you saw when we first came on is going to probably glaze over some eyes. Uh, folks who are uh, not uh, uh, thinking about what it, what it would mean. Arbitration, usurpation. It, it, the idea of the title, and I couldn't pronounce it too clearly, but the idea of the title is that the, the courts are starting, and the legislature, the federal legislature, has supported the idea that arbitration process is taking over what used to be reserved for civil litigation. That the challenging uh, bringing lawsuits and, and, and courts and the civil courts is now uh, being submerged under a process called arbitration. In uh, last uh, month in December, uh, the Supreme Court ruled uh, in a prime case uh, uh, involving DirecTV and customers of DirecTV uh, that the California law, which said that uh, arbitration clauses and contracts that these customers had signed with DirecTV when they engaged the services of DirecTV uh, were binding and despite a California law which prohibited such uh, agreements in overreach cases. So it's an important decision once again so the corporation is able to force an individual customer by an adhesion contract, a contract in which the customer never really negotiates to give up their right to be litigated. The impact of that is, that in this case, the amount of money that is involved in the wrongdoing that DirecTV was engaged in, pretty clearly uh, illegal behavior, was so small uh, that those, those litigants will never be able to recover it because of the onus and the burdens of arbitration. Anyway, to discuss this, we have with us Hap Ziegler, who is an attorney and a consultant, and uh, Hap and I have had some talk about this already, but uh, Hap, why don't you tell me, uh, tell us, the uh, audience and, and me, what is arbitration, uh, just in, in general, what is arbitration? All right. Arbitration is basically a pseudo court situation. So when there's a controversy, what happens is the parties decide on one or more than one individuals to act as a judge. They're not a judge. They could be a retired judge, but they're not an actual sitting judge at this time. It's not an actual court. But because of the agreement that Glenn mentioned, the parties agree to have these people or this person, this arbitrator, act in lieu of being able to go to the state or federal court system. So what happens is the agreement is that People can choose this arbitrator. The arbitrator listens as if it were a actual trial. Evidence is submitted. People make their examinations and cross-examinations. And the arbitrator or arbitrators come up with a decision. And that decision is enforceable in the same way an order of court would be enforceable. Okay. Well, you make it sound pretty desirable. <laughs> I say when I, when my, in my early days, uh, certainly I thought the idea of arbitration was clean cut. I sort of thought about this uh, imaginary uh, judicial person who was above influence, who was outside that system, who just came in, listened to the evidence quickly and succinctly without a lot of hoo-ha uh, hoo hoo -ha, and ruled. But the, the fact of the matter is, you know, who chooses these arbitrators? Well, again, you correctly interpreted as, as I was using the words and as most people use the words, it sounds pretty fair. Many agreements say 
party A can pick one arbitrator, party B can pick the other arbitrator, and the third arbitrator is picked by the two arbitrators already chosen. Sounds pretty fair. But let's look a second here at what's really going on. So we have multinational, multi-billion dollar corporation that tends to go to court all the time, or in this case, tends to arbitrate all the time. So these arbitrators who earn their living by being arbitrators get chosen by party A, this huge conglomerate corporation, and party B, little you or little me. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize that if you want to get chosen as an arbitrator again, you don't worry about little you or little me. You worry about whether you've appealed to multinational, multi-billion dollar corporation yeah. and their lawyers. So what sounds in words like it's very fair tends to be very biased. And there are statistics, didn't bring them today, there are statistics to show that when big corporations go into arbitrations, they win by an enormous percentage. Yeah, and, and remember, there are, and this, the other part of this is there is no appeal. Once the arbitrator rules, uh, the, the decision of the arbitrator is final. Uh, you've agreed to that when you agree to arbitration. So you're, you're, that's it. You're, it's, you're dead in the water. You're over. And so even if the arbitrator willfully violates the law of the, of the, of the case, or willfully ignores the facts of the case, there is no recourse for you as a litigant in this case. That's one of the problems with arbitration. Another problem is that uh, these, these arbitrators are, as you say, come out of these groups that are hired by corporations and that's how they make their living. So they have an inherent bias to get appointed again and again and again. There is no equivalent. Uh, you can't just go out in the street and say, oh, here's my arbitrator. I've got, a, I've got a local lawyer that I trust. I'll have him be the arbitrator. You can't do that. It has to be a person that's sort of certified as an arbitrator, which means, again, they're institutionalized in this underground economy. And the other, the other thing I, I, I read is that you don't even have to have a, a legal education to be an arbitrator. In many cases, you could simply, the minimum, the maximum uh, that some of these places require is a bachelor's degree. I, I've never been in that kind of arbitration. I've been in arbitrations. Um, <clears throat> so. representing clients, uh, I think in every instance I was there, they were, they, they either were or had been lawyers. Okay. But uh, that's amazing. I didn't even know that. Well, I, 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 you know, I'm, I think it probably depends on the jurisdiction. And again, uh, it bothers me that we're dumbing down the system uh, and, and, and taking away the ability of small parties to challenge large groups like in this case, that just came out of the Supreme Court, Direct Television, uh, Direct TV. That's a corporation that has something like 31 million customers, as I last saw, uh, uh, 30 some million customers. Think about what happened there. Let's say the, the issue in that case was what they were overcharging people monthly a small amount of, of, of money. Uh, maybe a dollar, uh, maybe fifteen dollars a month, or something well, say, like say that. Say one dollar. Well, a million, million. Yeah. yeah. So, so somebody says, you know, you should stop doing that. It's illegal. And they say, I don't. I'm not going to stop doing it. So, you know, take me to court. Take me to arbitra arbitration. And the guy says, Well, I'm not going to go to arbitration, and uh, because I I'm going to sue you, because what you're doing is so egregious. And they say, No, you're not, because you have an arbitration agreement. And by the way, if you want to go to arbitration, you have to put up. Anywhere from seven hundred dollars to two thousand dollars on your side, just to start the arbitration. My understanding is that I didn't investigate this. I should for this this presentation. I think it's seven hundred sixty dollars. Is that in in California the burden of paying for the arbitration falls on the drafter of the agreement? That's not that's what I'm not reading in these, in these other litigations. They said that, in fact, there's one coming out of California I would like to talk about a little bit later where, okay. and because you're going to say that this is an example of the most egregious kind of, that there's a $2,600 fee if you want to arbitrate, you as a litigant. So anyway, a person says, well, I'm not going to pay $500 or $700 out of my pocket to sue you for a $10 a month charge for the last two years, which is a couple hundred dollars. Uh, so I'm going, to, I'm going to go find a lawyer and take you to court. And the only, the only way this makes economic sense for the lawyers is if they can bring what's called a class action. And I think people should understand that. 
Well, let's just talk for a second about what a class action is so everybody's familiar. Well, I'm going so, to, oh, you're going to do I mean, that? You can do that. Yeah, but the point is that a whole bunch of people with small amounts of claims right. are brought together, and the impact of that litigation supports the hiring of an attorney and the bringing together of the, of the lawsuit. Yeah. To, you, to use your numbers, let's say there are 30 million people are overcharged a dollar a month. So over in a year, they're overcharged $12. So it's two or three years $36 worth of being overcharged, it, it would be ludicrous to assume that that individual would bring an action, even bring an action in small claims court where they're not allowed to have, no parties are allowed to have lawyers. Even that, the filing fee, I believe, is 50 or $75. But if you take 30 million people times $10 a month, you're talking real money there. The amount of damages that might be obtained. Yes. And, and the other side of the coin that I wanted to point out, and this is what I want to point out, it's not like, you know, there's a certain image, I think, that corporations have managed to convey to the public that lawyers who represent people in class action lawsuits are preying on the corporation. They're just gaming the system. They're taking advantage of small things. No, let's think about this. DirecTV illegally obtained let's say a dollar, ten dollars a month from 31 million customers. Every month they got 300 and some million dollars. Every month, 300 and some million dollars that they had no right to have. They were st stealing it basically. Let's assume that they knew they were doing this. They knew they shouldn't have been doing it. And yet the only thing you can do about that is individually, one at a time now, under this Supreme Court decision, you cannot bring a, a litigation because no class actions are allowed in arbitration I take it. No, no, you can't have class actions. The original suit was whether or not you can force arbitration. And the Supreme Court said, that was a couple years ago, 2013, I believe, they said, yes, you can force people into arbitration. This one says you can force them into arbitration and deny them the right to form a class in arbitration. Right, that's the, that's the point I'm making. So every, every individual who has their $150 claim has to go against this corporation, file a huge amounts of money, select an arbitrator, go through the process. So every one of those 31 million clients, uh, customers of DirecTV that have been cheated, are going to have to allegedly do this kind of nonsensical processing instead of having one lawsuit that would bring it all together, have a hearing, and get a result and stop the behavior and make them pay a penalty for remit some of the money they had stolen. And I use that word advisedly. If they knew what they were doing and they understood that what they were doing was wrong, and they often do, they just think there's nothing you can do about it because they've got you, you know, by the short. And then that's the, and and they're going to do it. And this is the the, the the bottom line. So when the Supreme Court says you shall that you're going to have to go to arbitration and you can't use state laws, California has a law that says arbitration is discouraged in California. Other states have similar laws. But the Supreme Court, because of a law, the Federal Arbitration Act of 1925, is now increasingly forcing uh, these burdensome contracts on individuals against the policies of the states in which they live. What about the Seventh Amendment? I, I know this is a little bit offhand here, but one of the things that bothered me about this when I was reading this, this is, we're not a lot of experts on the Seventh Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. The Seventh Amendment says, that you have a right to civil jury trials. There's an actual constitutional right to civil jury trials in the U.S. Constitution. I understand that that not yet been applied to the states. It's only in federal courts you have a right to civil jury trials. But there seems to me the implied recognition of that, that, that the right to sue, the right to bring a, a lawsuit in civil cases is an inherent basic idea in our society. Well, don't you think, though, that the position the contraposition, and, and probably that came up in some of these earlier cases, was yes, you have a right to it, but just like a right to a jury, you can waive that right. Uh huh. And so I'm sure the position of the poor people at DirecTV and their lawyers have it written that you've waived that right. So oh. just like you can waive the right to a trial by jury, you can waive a right to an actual courtroom hearing as opposed to an arbitration hearing. When you and I went to law school, when I went to law school, I remember yeah. being taught that uh, in order to have um, an effective contract, uh, you had to have an equal standing. You had to have people at equal arm's length uh, with the ability to, to negotiate. 
and understand what they were doing and, and actually on parity. When, when you and I get our cell phone or, or sign up one of these uh, for a credit card, we don't have that ability. We, can't, we, we aren't, we aren't going to be able to negotiate with, with uh, MasterCard or DirecTV. Uh, and so I think you know, the idea that you're, you're just explaining is, is valid that what it applies, but for decades and for centuries, I think, the courts were loath to support this kind of overreaching. And in fact, we, the reason California has a law that says we, don't, we discourage arbitration con adhesion ar contracts is because they understand that it's an overreach. It's important, for, I would ask anybody who's viewing this, did you read the agreement with your ISP, that is your service provider for your internet? Did you read your contract with your cell company? Did you even read your contract with your telephone provider, landline? Nobody reads these things, and if you did, if you read that and you said, I won't agree to that, I'm going to cross out that line, you would not get your cell phone. You would not get your internet providing. So it's, it, it, it is a contract of adhesion, not in a technical sense in that in theory you can go to another provider, but of course that other provider has the same, same terms. So there is actually, it is, it is not a contract of adhesion by law, it's a contract of adhesion by fact. Well, again, I, I've got this language that I've found, and I, I'm not sure what academic wrote this and what basis they have for it. We don't have time to document it here. But here's what one person says the FAA, the original Federal Arbitration Act of 1925, was designed to, to create in 1925 when it was passed. The principal purpose of the FAA was to require courts to enforce privately negotiated agreements of arbitration, like other contracts, in accordance with their terms. Form contracts or contracts of adhesion where one party offers terms on a non-negotiated, take or leave it basis were contrary to the intended purposes of the FAA. In fact, the legislative history makes clear that the Congress intended the FAA to target commercial parties of generally comp comparable bargaining power rather than consumers or investors, by the way. And investors are another party that's aggrieved heavily in these adhesion contracts because they can't sue their brokers and other people who nickel and dime them, right. Right. And, and the amount of loss you have never justifies the recovery. So no, no law, they're, they're insulated from law, lawsuits. So anyway, there's, I, I think that's a correct, you know, uh, uh, it makes sense that that would be the correct purpose of this. If, if General Electric and General Motors want to have, agree that they will, be, uh, they will abide by arbitration. Sure. Or well, Comcast sues Cox or vice versa. They're giants against giants. And if they feel arbitration is a quicker, yet fair way to resolve their contract agreement, I think that was the intent, is that they didn't have to go through the entire court system. They could make things happen quickly and much less expensively. Now it's being used as a bludgeon against the poor people. I have an interesting quote by Mr. I hesitate to use the word justice, even mm -hmm. deference, but Mr. Scalia, where when, when it was discussed while this case was being argued, <clears throat> I'm sorry, a prior case was being argued, Justice Scalia said uh, that the law does not guarantee the average person a cheap method of enforcing the law against big corporations. If you think about how ridiculous that is, what he's really saying is we're not giving the average person a way to have any indemnification from large corporations. Oh, yeah, what he's saying is that you just got to get <laughs> recognize the fact that you, unless you have the money, you're not going to be able to fight these people. That's right. And, and that's what bothered me. I, again, we, we ha talked about this briefly before, but I think inherent in the Seventh Amendment and inherent in the common law and inherent in the whole creation of the legal system was the idea that we were going to build a place in which those average citizens without much money could go and have a hearing a relatively fair hearing with a, with a neutral elected or appointed or otherwise judicially qualified official in a public place, not a private arbitration, uh, with all kinds of due process rights, including the right to have it reviewed by other courts so it'll be looked at. Right. All of that's going to happen 
And so that individual c can fight the big corporation. But now, uh, as Scalia says, this seems like a quaint idea to him. Here, here's an interesting piece of information, and it's an earlier case than the 2013 case. But the Supreme Court has, the United States Supreme Court has previously ruled that contracts may require arbitration rather than court litigation. Here are the operative words. Only if the arbitration proceeding provides an adequate forum for individuals to vindicate their rights. Our present Supreme Court that says they don't create law is just throwing away precedent case after case after case. Well, they took the, the case that we're discussing, <clears throat> the, the DirecTV case, actually involved a contract which said in its face Interesting, that, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, 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 that this, you are required to have arbitration unless the law of your jurisdiction prohibits such arbitration. The law of California did prohibit such arbitration. The Supreme Court nevertheless took this case up after, by the way, the other the lower courts had ruled for the plaintiffs, the, the people who were not trying, trying to fight arbitration, took it up, liberally reached down, grabbed this case, and brought it up to the court to decide. And they ruled, okay, we know that it said that at the time that it was written, but after it was written, a couple years later, we ruled that that, con that kind of clause is illegal, Therefore, we're going to nunk pro tunk or roll backwards and, and, and say that contract could never, you could never have made that agreement or, or whatever. I don't know. But, but if you really believe that the parties were negotiating, if you want to engage in the fantasy that DirecTV and its customers were actually negotiating, the language they negotiated was, I don't have to arbitrate you because I live in California and California prohibits such ar arbitration demands. But they ignored that again. Uh, reaching out and creating, uh, I, I think, legislating uh, uh, from the bench. It's, it, it, what's interesting, Ed, I think why Glenn wanted to have this show and for you watching, the, the important part is without class actions, charge cards, your charge card, your Visa, your Master Charge, your American Express, they used to charge interest on interest. Now think about how small that amount of money is but over your lifetime, it's thousands of dollars. But it's only a few hundred dollars or even less a year. Because of class actions, that practice was stopped. Bank charges that were charged to you without any knowledge to you, without any agreement by you, practice was stopped, not because somebody sued for $10, because they got a group of people together that there was enough money that qualified and intelligent lawyers could take these banks to court and make them stop that practice. Wage an hour, whether people are allowed to get their rest breaks for, for women, wet rest breaks in the morning and the afternoon, lunch for all employees. That's enforced because of class action. Yeah, all kinds of extra and hidden charges. That's why this case is so important. And it sounds, as Glenn said at the beginning, we don't want you to fall asleep listening to what we like to talk about, which is the intricacies of all this law, but because it affects every one of us every day. Class actions uh, are, are, are the vehicle by which ordinary people can make it, get corporations to pay attention, and, and without that, they laugh at you. I, I, I mean, they almost literally laugh at you. I'm sure they go back afterwards in, in their boardroom and, and chuckle about it. Here's a couple of examples that are coming up. One of the ones that I think is amazing that, that, that's in the news right now, Wells Fargo, another bank, was pressing its, its, its associates so heavily that to, to increase the business activity mm -hmm. that they were in charge of. Each, each of these, uh, right. what they call them, associates, had to write more and more contracts, get more and more customers, get more and more money in their, their control. So these associates went ahead and created false accounts. They took existing customers and had those existing, and, and unknown to the customers, created multiple accounts out of that existing account money threatening the, the security of those accounts, illegal as heck. They can't go out and start taking my, client, your, my, my money and make multiple accounts I don't even know about and cause me losses and other things that were happening. Somebody brings a lawsuit that says, we're going to sue you guys for, on a class action basis for, this, for, for getting your employees, Wells Fargo's employees, to do this. Wells Fargo says, oh, you can't do that. Uh, these people all agreed to arbitrate. 
And you say, well, no, we're not suing about the original agreement contract that they did sign. We're talking about this these new accounts that they never agreed to, they never signed. They had no idea we were even existing. One of our courts has just ruled that that original uh, adhesion contract that you would arbitrate, that you sign when you open the legitimate account, is protective of Wells Fargo from misconduct, what they did with all these other accounts and your money. This is the kind of thing that happens if you don't have it. Watch out, uh, Volkswagen and their whole scandal about these diesel engine things is offered this, they've made a big thing about offering you a $500 uh, rebate and a, and a free lifetime of steins of beer. I don't know what it was. Anyway, but, but one of the things that you don't know in the small print in there, in that contract, if you agree to that $1,000 package that they're offering you, you're going to sign a contract that says you give up the right to sue and you agree to arbitrate. And they, you know, it's worth $1,000 a customer to them to get you to give up your right to litigate because you'll get nowhere on the arbitration front. Well, so, and by, by the way, the, the $1,000 is not $1,000. It's a $500 well, we'll, gift we'll, certificate to buy their product. I, 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 yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, that's the, we have a, we're running out of time. Let's give it. All right. the, there's a new case coming down the road that uh, is before the Supreme Court right now, and I don't know where it's going and wh why they took it up and when they're going to rule on it, but it's, a, it's another California case in which the, the lower courts in California, in the federal court system in the West here, ruled that uh, a company, uh, MHN Government versus Zabrowski, could not enforce an arbitration agreement because the arbitration was so egregious, so outrageous and capricious that it violated the California law. Slightly different issue than the case that the court did reverse on. The arbitration provision, which was buried in the, in the contract you signed, number 20 of 23 paragraphs, had a six-month statute of limitations. You couldn't do anything if you didn't do it within six months to the, the behavior that the corporation was involved in. Um, they allowed the corporation to sue from the, I mean, to select who the arbitrators would be. You had no input into it, only them. You only had six months to bring this lawsuit. And the filing fees in this case, in this situation that you've agreed to allegedly on this is uh, $2,600. No way in the world that most people would bring a, uh, would enter in an arbitration paying $2,600 using their selected panels in a six month period of time for a few dollars damages. And then yet they are being prohibited from bringing a lawsuit as a class in order to, to, to package that damages up. So the corporation is allowed, is theoretically going to be able to get away again with this abuse. Well, look, look for the case to come down. Whether that, hope, hopefully the Supreme Court will say that these unconscionable terms can't be enforced. Okay, we're running out of time. Thank you, uh, back uh, Juanita and the, uh, 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 Allie, <laughs> and thanks to the station. Thanks, Hap. Uh, we'll see you later in another show.